Hello, this is Anthony Horsch of Old Cowtown Museum. I want to give you a little bit of information about a new exhibit that we're going to be opening up very shortly, which is the Wichita Carriage Works and Repository. The purpose here is to give you a little bit of background information about the particular exhibit itself, as well as transportation in Wichita itself. So whenever most people think about the Old West, they think of things like Marshall Dillon and Dodge City and Little House on the Prairie. And basically you see a couple of different styles of rolling stock. You see stagecoach, buckboards, wagons, and that's about it. But if you lived in Wichita in the 1870s, there were a lot more things that were going on, a lot more different vehicles that were being used. Most people in our town actually walked from place to place because the town was small enough. If you needed to go in greater distances, you could rent a horseback or a buggy from the livery stable to go for farther distances. But that being said, there are still a whole lot of vehicles that are not represented that we want to showcase. Old Cowtown Museum has over 30 vehicles in storage that we would really love to show. And that is the whole purpose behind of creating this repository. So what were things like in the good old days? Well, if you're in a larger city, there were stables everywhere because horses are the main way that people are getting around. They had to be fed and taken care of as well as cleaned up after as well as exercised. And so there were a lot of money to be made from supplying just basics of food and straw to the horses themselves. In some ways, you can think of those people as the gas station of the 1870s. Blacksmiths were would have then been the repair garage. So you've got both things happening in the same time. Just for an example, though, in the 1870s London, over one million horses were stabled there and 1000 tons of manure had to be removed from the streets every day. So there's a lot of industries that are all connected with animal power in our time period. In the era that we are focusing on in the 1870s, things are quite a bit in transition. Carriage building started in the Northeast with their main customers being in the South. During the Civil War, those Northeastern producers lost their main per consumers and slowly, 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 they began to move production out where there was demand, which was out in the West, which in our time would have been Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and places like that. This gives rise to a number of companies that you're probably pretty familiar with. Studebaker is probably the most well-known. John Deere, of course, did wagons before they became a plow factory. Rock Island Plow and Wagon Factory is up near Chicago, Charter Oaks. So there's lots and lots and lots of new industry that is happening. But the industry that we are seeing is a change from what was traditionally happened. Traditionally, you would have a shop that would do wagon building on the side and you built it one at a time as opposed to factory type system. And that's what's going on in our era, this rise of the factory system. Wichita, though, being just a new town just starting out, didn't have factories. And so they reflected the changes that were happening in the United States, starting out as small craft industries and slowly developing into a factory system. So looking in the newspapers of the time, in 1870, the first person that is listed is a Mr. Alba, and it's pretty obvious by looking at his advertisement that he's basically building to order. If you want a wagon, you go to him, he'll create what it is that you'll need. Noticed in two years later in 1872, he's added a couple of notations. Um, everything in the carriage wagon makers line for sale at reasonable prices. Every new wagon is of my own hand and warrant, warranted by he himself. 
He's also added buggy trimmings as well as malleable castings. So he's becoming a little bit more sophisticated in the offerings that he is providing for the people of Wichita. Now, not too terribly long after that last advertisement, Mr. Alba seems to step back from the business. He rents out his shop to two gentlemen, Mr. Paul and Mr. Letts, and lets them go ahead and take up the business of, of uh, blacksmithing in wagon production. And if you'll notice that the advertisement on the right, that they have pretty much just taken his advertisement and changed the name on the top. Now, another gentleman that worked for Mr. Alba was JN40, and he was very popular in our ear. There's quite a few advertisements about him, and he is now offering not only wagons, but also carriages, and notice it says in the latest and best patterns, short notice to do anything in the blacksmithing repairing horseshoeing line, prices moderate and work warranted. So there you go. And you can see just a couple of years later that his shop is doing very, very well, but he highlights that he is now a carriage maker as well as a blacksmith. And so he seems to be specializing quite a bit more. In 1872, we also have the rise of a new gentleman, Mr. Mosier, and he is an, a new person there, but notice his focus is largely on general blacksmithing. Notice he does plow repair and the like. By 1873, a week, year later, he's become the old reliable Mr. Mosier, and notice he is paying special attention to farmer's work repairing plows and harrows and agricultural implements. So he's probably not spending too much time in creating rolling stock. And then a strange thing happens in the early part of 1873. Uh, Mr. Alba jumps back into the business and he has taken one of his former um, owners jobs and he is now working with Mr. Letts. Don't have any idea what happened to the other gentleman, but he fades from the pages of history and he picks up where the other two gentlemen had left off and very quickly within six months, Mr. Alba is only working by himself. So at this point, we have about three possibilities as far as wagons but again, most all of them are being made one at a time. To this, we have a new gentleman in 1874, Mr. Avery, who does not advertise himself as a blacksmith, does not advertise him as anything but a wagon and carriage maker, which is a distinct pivot as far as what people are doing in our era. Then we have the rise of another gentleman, Mr. Bradley, coming in 1875. And notice where he is headquartered. He is now at the old Alba stand. So what became of Mr. Alba? That deserves some investigation, whether he has passed on or has moved out of the area or has retired. It's hard to tell without any further research. But Mr. Bradley is taking up resident at his former shop. And then another year later, Mr. Avery is now fully, fully invested in the Wichita trade, but notice that his shop is in connection with Yike and Granger's blacksmith shop. So he is there to do the work, but he is primarily focused on wagons and carriages. Next we have a different dimension. We have Mr. N.G. Davis, and he is selling name brand material, Jackson Wagon from up north in Michigan. Notice the uh, advertisement on the top of your screen, hauling Dumbo down the, down the road. So his wagons must be very, very, very good. So uh, if you want to, you can stop by and take a look at his wagons and buggies at the planter's house on Douglas Avenue. But he has splendid stock, but he not necessarily is making them. 
To this, we have a very interesting entry in 1877. We have a gentleman, Mr. Danger, who is holding an auction and he is selling more name brand stuff. Nielsen Baroches, Granger's Two Seaters, Brewster's Side by Side, Gold's Jumpstart, Concord Spring Buggies, Piano Box, Coal Box, Farmer Spring Wagons. So he has a wide variety of things that he is selling at auction, but there's a couple of things to note. Warranted for one year. Now I wonder who the warranty is with because we've never seen Mr. Danger before and whether or not he will be a going concern, as they would say, is hard to tell. Will be sold regardless of cost. So you can probably pick up something cheap if you, if you play your cards right. Mr. Davis now ventures a little bit farther from what he had before. He is now creating a repository basically a place where you can come and see all the different vehicles that he has for sale. And he wants to tout that in one week he sold over $1,100 worth of product. So he seems to be doing very, very well in the town of Wichita. In 1878, we have a Mr. George Bross, who is a blacksmith, but again, he is still willing to do wagon and carriage iron work, not necessarily wagons, but maybe more of a repair shop, but he is in business as another opportunity. So, we have the city fathers getting together with a gentleman by the name of Mr. McDaniels of St. Louis, who is negotiating with the Board of Trade to create a wagon works or factory here in Wichita. He will have the building opposite of Douglas Avenue House, and he will have seven houses for the employers and their family. Now, the partners, Mr. Daniel Powitzi and Paulus, are all gentlemen who had been working for a particular company and have decided to strike out on their own. And so here they are in April of 1882, coming to set up shop here in Wichita and create a dedicated factory that is creating wagons and buggies and the like. Now, the first advertisement for him comes in 1882. Notice the fine carriages, buggies, and spring wagons. But there is some doubt about what's going on. The weekly leader up in Emporia says that it is intimidated on the streets today that a St. Louis parties were here who contemplated starting a roller skating rink in Emporia. That's the mind of the average Emporian runs. It is a settled fact that the proprietors of the Wichita Carriage Factory mean business they are here and have already commenced work. How will that compare with your roller rink? So a little, little competition. Now, it is a very curious thing in our time period that newspapers are not necessarily news dispensing, but are also very much promotional vehicles. And so they are letting everyone know that Mr. Snitzler, the owner of the saloon and one of the saloons in town, has ordered a $300 fade on. The Root Brothers have contracted for a 285 job, doesn't say what they're buying, but Major Drum has a $200 buggy, Cash Henderson has a fine sulky for 225, and the same, oh, C.R. Miller is getting a buggy for 225, and Mr. Ross at the same time. Now, the thing to remember too, in this particular era, the average working guy is getting about a dollar a day, maybe a dollar twenty-five, maybe a dollar fifty, and to be able to purchase Mr. Snitzler's Phaeton at three hundred dollars is going to be a major, major expenditure. And so, again, we are on the understanding that most of these are for people of means or people who have money. Now, for the next year. 
This is the advertisement that McDaniel, Powitz, and Paulus advertise in the paper. Runs weekly and seems to be a fairly upstanding and well-run business. At least that's the image that we are given. In July 13, he rebuilds a delivery wagon for A.D. Wheeler. And the Times reports that visiting the carriage works, we find they are working under good encouragement and feel pleased with their enterprise. They also list the following orders. Mr. Corbett got a canopy top for a park wagon. Mr. Steele got a spring buggy. Mr. Smith from Valley Center. Now, if you're not from here in Wichita, that's about 10, 15 miles northeast of Wichita. So we're expanding our market. We're not just supplying Wichita people. Mulvane is more to the southwest of, or southeast of Wichita, and he's getting a fine bar top buggy. And they're also in the process of creating carriages and two fine phaetons as well as a, a high side stick surrey. So things look like they are doing very, very well. Although there's a couple of things that are on the horizon that may be a little bit concerning. October 18, 1882, the Carriage Works is now using as their display room or their order taking system, Mr. Smythe and Sons, who is a hardware store. He also produces and sells um, agricultural implements and so now you're supposed to visit with them as opposed to go directly to the factory and then on march 21 of 1883 we understand that dr peck of Eureka has taken an interest in the carriage factory but uh, in april of that same year the newspaper states that wichita carriage works company is receiving more orders than they can fill and are putting in a larger force, they expect to have 20 men at work in a few weeks. But at some point, the St. Louis men sell out to Perrine and company. And May 7, there's an article in the newspaper, where is the showroom? We can't find the showroom. People are looking to find where they can purchase vehicles and there is no place they can go. Well, a day later, Mr. Perrin comes in and says, oh, we know, we know where it is. It's over here by Truss Office and Boss's Furniture. And so that's where it's now located. But it's a very curious thing that it was such a low key that not everybody knew where it was. So in May of 1883, the Wichita Patent Spring owned an used by the Perrine Company is now something that's going to put them on the map. Everybody from all around is going to be using their springs and it looks like it's going to be a way to cement their reputation and their business as well. But it is interesting to note that the patent for it does not actually apply until a couple of months later, and it's also interesting to note who is on the patent form. Mr. Peck, who had an interest in the business, Mr. Perrine, who's now the current owner, and Mr. Daniel, who is the previous owner. Very, very, very interesting goings on. By 1883 in July, a man by the name of Taylor came from Ohio and purchased the house and lot that was occupied by the carriage works. And then, just a couple of months later, we find out that Mr. Smith came down to investigate the carriage works and purchased it from Perrine and Company. And so we now have a new company, Smith and Taylor, predecessors of the Perrine and Company, Wichita Carriage factory. Notice it is listed now as a factory. And very shortly, we have another gentleman, Mr. L.C. Wood, who is a local man. He lets everyone know that he is now operating the shop, running the shop, maybe as a manager, I guess. And he will guarantee that the work is done first class 
and there is now a paint shop on grounds and so things are going to be swimming so march 27 1884 hmm not too long a couple of months later mr l c wood has sold his interest tools in the carriage factory to dan mckinney of marion indiana well now this is an interesting turn of event most likely he will carry carry on the name as the wichita carriage factory in may of that in just a couple of weeks notice that the people who are running the newspaper can't quite figure out how to spell his name so he is now listed as Mr. McKinsey, who is the proprietor, and he's going to add five more workers. And so it looks like the business is going to rise again from the dust of decline. Now, if you are from Wichita, you may be curious where his factory was or where the original factory was. Uh, if you find the corner of Douglas and Water, there is a, on the fire, fire, Sanford fire maps, there is an indication of where a particular building may well have been. Um, they don't exactly give out street addresses, so one is left to speculate. But here we have the first advertisement, the only carriage factory in the Southwest. Well, at this point, he's a concern of about five men, so little bit of little bit of preemptive advertising i guess one might say so upon arrival and upon occupying that one particular building he very quickly has begun to create a new shop a new building um, some of the people noted that where he started out was in a barn. Now, we don't really have any pictures or descriptions to know exactly what kind of a building it was, but needless to say, it was not suiting his needs. And so immediately he starts to create a two-story building and he is going to be, he's employing 12 people at that particular time makes one wonder where he is getting his money from. So this is where things are located now. 1884 is whenever he is putting up his building, but he has chosen well. There are two lumber yards nearby. There is a machine and foundry shop nearby. The rail line comes right down through his property. There is a freight depot very, very close by as well as several blacksmiths. And so he, should he require to farm out some of his business, he would have those businesses quite at hand. And so he's chosen a very, very good location. In November of that same year, not soon after he has opened his shop, uh, in the new building, 16 workmen, seven blacksmiths, two woodworkers, two tremors, five painters. On the first floor, we have blacksmith forges that are doing the, the undercarriage assembly as well as the wheel riding. We also have a repository, so his showroom is located at the factory, no longer wandering around town trying to find the back of a particular building. On the second floor is where the assembly goes on. The woodworkers are there as well as the paint and the trim. But in a very, very progressive move, follow, rather than doing the roll down a ramp like a lot of carriage factories did in our era, he actually had an elevator installed. And so it's a very quick and efficient method of getting his stock between, between floors. He does take on a rather large heavy wagon for Polk and Harris. And it is interesting to note that the Polk and Harris believe that they would have to go outside the city of Wichita to create such a vehicle or to find such a vehicle. But no, lo and behold, the Wichita carriage factory can do it for you. So we have a real factory, a real concern happening here. 
1890, 10 years later, um, we now have 30 men. The payroll is about $400 a week. Business is about 500,000. And it is the largest concern of the kind to be found in the state. And that says a lot. Now, he does out get a lot of his materials from far away. Notice that the hardware was purchased in St. Louis and Chicago. The woodwork and lumber comes from Ohio. Cloth directly from the importer in Philadelphia. Leather tops from the New Jersey factory. Axles and springs from Pittsburgh. And I love this. The varnish department has two of the most imported varnishes available, known being used very freely. So we are really up and running. We are really creating wagons and characters, carriages for the public of Wichita. So who are the people that are opening up this business? Well, Daniel Frederick McKenzie, born in Detroit, Michigan, is the owner. And Margaret Ann McKenzie, well, I should back up and say not necessarily the owner. The two of them were incorporated together. He was the artisan behind it. They have two children that are in this photograph. Leo, who was born in 1886, and Donald Bilt, born in March of 1890. To give you just a little bit more information about these people, Margaret Ann Friend was born in Ontario, Canada. Her father was a carriage maker, and lo and behold, Daniel McKenzie apprenticed for him. They were married in 1877, and they quickly moved to Indiana to try and create their own factory. But they were not successful and returned back to Canada before moving back to Kansas. Over the life of the union, they had seven children. They note, the family notes that th three of their children died in 1889 of diphtheria. And of that seven, we only have Leo and Don survive. They moved to Wichita in 1884. Unfortunately, in 1890, Daniel has a debilitating stroke and she cares for him while running the business until his death in 1906. And she continued to run the business another 14 years until 1920. She retired, moved to California, and died there soon after. Little is known about whether or not she had an illness or was just of older age. Daniel himself was born in Detroit, Michigan. His father was a mill worker there in Detroit and unfortunately died in an industrial accident. They moved to London, Ontario, doesn't don't really know what drew them to that part of the world, but that is where they went. Uh, he apprenticed with James Friend, married Margaret Anne in 1877, again, moved to Wichita in 1884 after having a business failure in Indiana. So one must get the impression that dad or her dad is helping them out or someone is helping them out because to immediately put up a new building after he was just in charge of a failing business must have some sorts of, of money happening somewhere. Unfortunately, yes, he did die in 1906 and his sons at the time were 20 and 17. So think about that. To, leave, to be out of the business basically from about 1889 and dying several years later, leaving those attendant children. Here's a photograph that has, that's kind of a, nothing of real significance other than just a glimpse of family life. Uh, we have Leo, the oldest on the armchair, and way in the back corner we have Don, who took over the business a little bit later. There is a woman peeking out around the doorway, which most consider was Margaret's mom, who lived with them, 
having come down from Canada. So here's a picture in the middle 1880s of the crew. Daniel is in the center with all of his workmen. From all accounts, he seemed to be a very genial man that seemed to be well at getting along with lots of different people, a very hard worker, and looks like he's got a bright future in front of him. Here is one photograph of M. A. Mackenzie. Um, it is a very interesting thing that the Carriage Works was incorporated and owned with the, both names intact. Wichita Carriage Works, no longer factory, and M. A. Mackenzie is the masthead. Very interesting that that they donated, noted the wife as being the one who is the one who is listed on the incorporation papers and known as the forefront. In this article in 1884, once again, we still haven't quite figured out to spell Mr. McKenzie's name, but nonetheless, we have Mr. Eckhart having a carriage or a bakery wagon built for him. And notice it said that whenever his handsome gray horses are attached to it, it'll be evidence of what kind of work the factory can turn out. So again, the newspaper is promoting this business that is helping to put Wichita on the map. A report from the newspaper in 1884, again, that you could find, you could have um, work done here in Wichita for cheaper and in quicker than you could in Kansas City. And so we are now focusing our sights on the other competitors. Mr. Kinsey also branches out. This is an advertisement from the newspaper, the German language newspaper. And if you'll notice on the masthead on the top, we have Wichita Carriage Works. And on the side, we have M.A. McKenzie and Company. So very curious as to why, why they did that. It, would, it was very unusual at the time to include the lady of the house in any kind of business related activity. In 1885, in April, to put themselves on the map, they got a rather, rather large sign painted on one side of the building, and we hope to reproduce that to a degree. But to add interest, they sold 13 vehicles that week. They now have 15 employees, and remember, started out with five, quickly jumped to 12, and by 1890, they will have 30. So much work that they are recruiting more workmen from Chicago to do their work. And this is the Wichita Carriage Works with its wonderful new sign. Notice the arrow on the photograph pointing toward Daniel. And there you can see some of the buggies rolling out. Notice on the left hand side, the door, you can see a, a buggy sticking out. That is the repository side of the business, the warehouse or the showcase, shall we say. <clears throat> so in May of 1885, Wichita Carriage Works had turned out a splendid butcher wagon. And they are also now beginning to refurbish secondhand buggies and harness. It appears that business is so good that they really can't keep up making, making wagons and buggies from scratch. Now, we don't have any real pictures of what that wagon built for Hutchison was like, but given some of the photographs of some of the vehicles that they created, this is most likely similar to what they created for him. In 1885, the McKenzie has a rather magnificent display at the
County Fair. They have buggies and carriages and phaetons, one man buggies, spring wagons, delivery wagons, but simply elegant and reflect on them, the makers and upon the city that boasts such manufacturing establishment. So good promotion for Wichita itself as well. So the buggy that uh, that they are cre creating, they created a single seater and a double seater. The buggy was the most popular vehicle in our particular era. It was the every man's car. And with mass production, some of them sold as low as $20. So you can see that if you are going to make more money, you're probably going to need to invest in a more substantial vehicle as opposed to just cranking out buggies for the common man, shall we say. Other things that they were created, um, the Buckborg wagon, which you see at the bottom, notice the footrest that is on the front as well as the buckboard, a way to protect the driver from any kicking from the horses. On the other side of the page, we have a spring wagon, basically your farmer's pickup truck. And I chose this photograph because you can see on the undercarriage that we do definitely have springs on it. So this was a much, much, much more easier ride than even the buckboard because the springs that it had on it were very, very, very minimal. So other things that they were created for the common man. Um, on the left, we have the sulky two wheeled vehicle often used for horse racing, but notice it sits rather low to the ground. The gig cart is a little bit more higher center of gravity, used less for racing, but more for getting around from place to place. So if you have to choose between a buggy or a sulky or a gig, this of course would be the cheaper route to go. Although of course there is no weather protection should the weather turn poor. So we have now covered a lot of the basic kinds of things that people were creating. But in our era, transportation is no longer the main focus of having a vehicle. With the rise of middle class, the rise of money, owning and driving a vehicle was a status symbol. No longer to get from one place to another, but to be out and about and to be seen going there. Some of the first parks created in larger cities were meant to provide a place for the wealthy to promenade in their vehicles and show off the vehicles that they have. People in our era, especially the wealthy, were judged by the kind of vehicle that they drove, the brand that they use. It's kind of like driving a Mercedes versus, versus a Toyota. People kind of judge you. And it was not just the wagon or the carriage that people were looking at. They looked at the complete image. The horses should harmonize with the wagon, with the carriage and the driver's uniforms as well as the passenger's clothes. So it becomes more of a social status as opposed to just transportation. McKenzie did create some of these very nicer vehicles. Uh, the Victoria was one of an open carriage named after Queen Victoria, could seat two people, had a coachman to drive along. He had a green or blue upholstery, so it was very, very well classed vehicle. He also built two styles of Surreys. Now you probably are familiar, the, the musical talks about the Surrey with the fringe on top. Well, that's the kind of vehicle that he was creating as well. He created a hard top version and one with an open top, all of which provide some very, very comfortable riding whenever you are going down the street. He did eventually branch out into the elite of the vehicles in our time period. The Baroque, uh, expensive vehicle, 
you can sit for two facing forward, two facing backward. Unfortunately, there is only a roof for the people sitting in the back, so I'm not quite sure what that says. But the Lando is the one, the next version up. You can see from the top picture on the, on the right, uh, the carriage be, does become completely enclosed, but whenever the weather is nice, you can convert it down to an open top vehicle in which you can be seen by those who are watching you promenade through the park. And last but not least, we have the Phaeton, the very, very sporty open wheeled vehicle, open top vehicle. You may be able to notice by the photograph that it has a very, very sharp turning rate radius. It does have the fifth wheel and you can tell by the indentation that the front wheels can almost turn completely underneath the vehicle. So it's very, very fast, very, very dangerous by most people. And the name comes from Phaeton, the son of Helios, who nearly set the earth on fire while attempting to drive the chariot of the sun. Mackenzie also show, sold accessories. Notice we've got some brass lamps that he could sold to put on your on your carriage. He also sold uh, braided leather whips. Could also buy them made out of walnut or cherry wood or rosewood. You could also have them tipped with silver. You could also have those engraved. On the right hand side, you can see that there's a bunch of of um, blankets for keeping warm in the winter time and we also sold foot warmers so that you can keep yourself warm while you are traveling out in the winter months and so diversification was the next way that you are going to try and make more and more money now we are not without our challenges again we have another gentleman who Mr. Cooper, who is importing all kinds of vehicles from all over the United States, generally from the Midwest, St. Louis, Moline, Indiana, Columbus, Ohio, South Bend. So we have lots and lots of vehicles that we are selling, name brand vehicles that we're selling, buggies from 50 to 150, and again, they are warranted for one year. The only problem is, who is this Mr. Cooper and uh, how can he warrant it such a vehicles? Well, it is interesting because not too long from there, uh, Mr. Cooper does sell out and now we have the West Southwestern Carriage Repository. Again, Parkson, Glunt and Kelly are now selling name brand vehicles in competition with the local vehicles but just gives you an idea of the competition that is occurring. By 1887, you can see by the circle at the top of the, of the screen and the detail on the right, you can see that our, we have expanded quite a bit. We have coal bin, stock room. So this is becoming quite the factory complex. And so we are well on our way to making our mark in this part of the country. Unfortunately, in 1888, we have a fire. Two-story building full of well-seasoned, primed buggy and carriage stock. Stock valued at $7,000, only insured for $5,000. Building valued for at 15, only insured for 500. Now, this version of the Sanford fire maps doesn't locate where the building is, so a rough guesstimate would be somewhere in that area in the red. 1890, just two, two years later, the advertisement for the Wichita Eagle newspaper. Notice the smoke coming out of the smokestacks. Notice on the drawing of the building, we have the repository on the left. There is lots and lots and lots of business, but notice the repository. Look at the different variety of styles and vehicles that they have for sale. 
Most likely the one at the lower left is a Phaeton. Don't know that for sure, but lots of vehicles that they do have for sale. Looking inside the shop, it's not necessarily the, the cleanest place, shall we say. Uh, I selected this picture largely because of the people that are in it. So Leo, that 20 year old boy left by his father is in the center and Don is at the far right, 17 year old boy. So just to give you an idea of what the automation is like, rather than building a wheel from scratch, each piece one by one by one, here is a breakdown of a carriage factory in which you can see all of the different levels are created in creating the, the wheels. The bottom right, we have this, the boring, uh, the fellows are shaped, the spokes are on the very, very top. And then on the right hand side, we have a cutaway from another factory, just giving you an idea of some of the activities that are going on. In the bottom left, we've got the, the painting and the finishing on the right as well. Not exactly sure what the guys on the middle right are doing, whether they're testing it by jumping up and down. It's hard to tell, but we don't know. In 1890, as mentioned several times, Daniel has a stroke and is not able to carry on with the business. As you'll notice in the Sanford fire maps, the name now becomes the M.A. McKenzie Carriage Works, and it lists as the successor to or M.A. McKenzie Manufacturing Company, a successor to the Wichita Carriage Works. Although, as noted earlier, both names have been used interchangeably, but from now on, the manufacturing becomes the main title of the business. As time progresses, as we get to the turn of the century, we start to voyage into horseless carriages, although I did find it humorous, the one at the, the top left, we have a very nice vehicle that would be pulled by a motor now being pulled by a horse. In 1920, uh, Margaret died. She left everything to Leo. She obviously had some problems with Donald and the very well known that she didn't like Donald's wife and and the wife refused to be buried in the same plot that the mother was. Don took Leo to court to came, claim some of the inheritance and the arbiter ruled that Don got the carriage work business and Leo went on to create his own manufacturing business as well as the properties that he held um, two of which are on Old Cowtown Museum, the McKenzie House, formerly the Girl Scout headquarters, and the Story and a Half House just across the street from it as well. Unfortunately, in 1929, we have another tragedy happen. Uh, a gas leak, not necessarily at their site, but nearby, and it catches their buildings and their stock and in flames and it basically ends the carriage works and the mckenzie company don still owning the uh, land puts in a filling station near where the original factory was but unfortunately the depression ended his entrepreneurial business so what is it that we are creating well, the, we're going to take our cue from the original building. The original was a two-story building with the elevator. Unfortunately, that is way too expensive for us. So we are going to have a single-story building that has a false front that is reminiscent of what they had. Uh, we do have but one door in the center, uh, largely for economy shape but we still think that it will represent the business well and give you a sense of what people were using to purchase their vehicles. The interior, we have space for 10 vehicles on display, although we are 
optimistic that we may get a few more than that. In the very, very back, we have the industrial technology of the time, which is a line shaft. And so you'll be able to go in and see some of those machinery that are powered in our repair shop. So that comes to the end of our presentation about the carriage factory repository, uh, the McKenzie factory and the, the Wichita carriage works. We are greatly indebted to the family that still exists. Um, there are several in the Wichita area. We've re received quite a bit of good information about the family and, and their knowledge of, of the business as well. But we look forward to presenting this shortly so that you can see the diversity of what people had to travel about in Wichita.